Herzlich willkommen bei Legendary Games, heute mit einer Sonderfolge und zwar ist uns ein kleiner Coup gelungen. Wir haben das erste Interview mit einem Originalentwickler aus der damaligen Zeit und Sascha, wir beide waren tief beeindruckt davon, dass der Mann sich so lange Zeit genommen hat. Um wen handelt es sich denn? Ja, es handelt sich um David Crane. David Crane hat ein paar Jahre bei Atari gearbeitet und sich Spiele und Cartridges dafür herausgebracht und danach irgendwann sich abgespaltet mit anderen Atari-Entwicklern und ist rübergegangen zu Activision, beziehungsweise hat es mitbegründet, nicht rübergegangen, sondern hat es gegründet sogar. Ja, und äh, das Interview hat doch sehr lange gedauert, zu unserer Überraschung. Mr. Crane war sehr, sehr geduldig, hat wahnsinnig viele Geschichten erzählt, Anekdoten und seine Meinung zur heutigen Games-Industrie und, und, und. Also brutto waren es, glaube ich, knappe drei Stunden, mit dem er sich mit uns unterhalten hat. Genau, das Interview ist komplett auf Englisch. Wir wünschen euch viel Freude beim Anschauen. Und dazu gab es natürlich auch einen Anlass, warum wir ihn eigentlich ursprünglich angeschrieben haben. Es gibt auch eine Episode zu Decathlon. Das ist ein altes Spiel von Activision von 1983. Und daraufhin hat uns dieser Mann eben auch geantwortet. Für da nochmal vielen Dank. Ähm, und ja, jetzt einfach mal die Folge in die Folge reinschauen und auch bis zum Ende dabei bleiben, lohnt sich zumindest für Retro-Fans, weil es geht nicht nur um Decathlon, sondern es geht auch um seinen größten Hit äh, Pitfall oder auch um Little Computer People oder um Grand Prix oder was er sonst noch gemacht hat. Genau. Ganz wichtig, Ghostbusters, wäre auch eine tolle Folge. <lacht> Okay, ja, vielleicht kommt die mal, wer mhm. weiß. Wir, machen, wir hauen sie ja nicht so im Akkord raus, aber genau. äh, wer weiß. Okay, dann viel Spaß beim Anschauen und nicht vergessen zu abonnieren und eventuell auch Kommentare runterzuschreiben. Welche Fragen hättet ihr ihnen denn gestellt? Weil der Mann hat uns zugesichert, wenn wir Ghostbusters machen sollten, dann dürfen wir ihn nochmal anrufen und dann würden natürlich auch eure Fragen gestellt werden. Genau. Vielen Dank und viel Spaß beim Zuschauen. Viel Spaß. Hello everybody, it's Legendary Games again, uh, this time with more than one premiere. Uh, we are on a show together with a guest, a special guest from America, and he has taken its ta his time for answering a lot of questions about our, t uh, our topic today. And the topic will be a, an old game he has invented and programmed by himself. It's called Decathlon from Activision from the year 1983-1984. And we are doing the podcast again as a duo. Sasha, hi. 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 And Mr. Crane, welcome on the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, we have prepared a lot of questions for you, <clears throat> and we are pretty excited doing it uh, for the first time with a guest. So um, maybe we can start with uh, a short introduction. How did you get in contact with the video game industry, and when did you finally decide the, to de when did you finally decide to enter the gaming industry? I was trained as an electronic engineer, <clears throat> and um, I also was a uh, tournament tennis player. And I was playing with my doubles partner at the time, who was Alan Miller. And one night he said. Um, read this ad that I'm, I've just written to, that's going to go in the newspaper tomorrow and you know just tell me if it's written correctly. And it was an advertisement for programmers to work at Atari to make video games. And okay. at the time I was working as an engineer at National Semiconductor, but um, I read the ad and said, yes, it's well written. In fact, it sounds like kind of an interesting job. And um, I decided I would interview for the job. So I went back to my, my job at National Semiconductor, went back to the company at 10 o'clock that night and wrote up a resume on a computer that I had built from scratch. They didn't have any computers in the uh, engineering lab at the time, so I made one for, for us to use. <clears throat> and typed up a resume. I went in at 10 o'clock the next morning and interviewed for the job. And by two o'clock in the afternoon, received an offer and gave notice at my company. So in less than 24 hours, I read an ad written by a friend and decided to uh, change jobs and become video game designer at Atari. So did you play games before you decided to go to, go to Atari or was it just a jump in the black, in the dark? <laughs> well, there weren't a lot of games in 1977. Um, 
but I mm. played arcade games. I was the pinball wizard for my local, you know, arcade. Um, so I had certainly done a lot of game playing. Okay, so you had contact with games before, but we all remember those uh, kind of, um, was heißt an Automat? Arcade. Arcade, uh, arcade time where you had to go to a gaming hall to to, to access games because uh, I guess the Atari 2600 is from 1977, 78, around that time? It was around 1975, but it was 1977 before it became a really big thing. Oh, okay. So it was released even before that time. And uh, was it released when you have entered Atari? Yes. I was being hired to make games for that system. Okay, I see. And what kind of projects were the first one you were working on? Because we've checked Wikipedia and uh, sometimes it's not like totally correct because some people are not named officially on a game um, because that was one of the points why the Activision people broke up with Atari because they couldn't have the na their names as an Easter egg in a game or so. And um, is it really the first game you have worked on, which is on Wikipedia? Uh, Sasha, what is the game? Um, you Outlaw. Know? Outlaw. Yeah. yeah, it says Outlaw. Or oh, Bockel. Bockel was unreleased. Bockel was unreleased. I think that came a little later. But Outlaw was my first game. And... Um, You know, a new game programmer at Atari was handed a manual that said, this is how the Atari 2600 works mm -hmm. and see what you can do with it. And we didn't have a lot of direction. We didn't have a lot of people telling us what to do at that time. Um, so, you know, I experimented with the system and I made this game. Outlaw is inspired by... I think an arcade game, I think by Midway, uh, Gun Gunslinger or anyway, there was a there was a, a game light like shooter. Yeah, there was a game like that in the arcades. Okay, And so I, I figured out how to make that game work on the Atari. So after having your first steps made in, at Atari, um, wh what was it back in the days? Could you develop the video game genre type of game completely free or did you have some a boss or someone telling you, okay, the next thing which is coming up is a racing game or a shooter or um, something like Space Invaders or whatever? Or could you decide freely, hey, I have an idea that might work. I'm just going for that approach. There was a little bit of, of both. Um, the Atari system could only do certain things. So it, it was... It was known by the management at Atari that it's not a good idea to decide what what game to make until the programmer looks at what the game system is capable of doing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you try to make a game that doesn't work with that hardware, you end up with a really bad game. So the programmers and game designers at Atari had a lot more control because we were the only ones who could tell management what we could do, what game we could make. On the other hand, the Atari game system was made by Atari in order to bring their arcade games into the home. Atari was very big in the arcades. Yeah, and they we know. Tank, and they had Pong and, and they had Pac-Man. I was working there. They had a dozen, you know, arcade games in the arcades, and they thought if if you went to the arcade and you played Tank, now you could go to the store and buy the Atari VCS, and it comes with Tank combat cartridge, so you could play their arcade games at home. In fact, that's the only reason that they made the machine cartridge programmable. Mm -hmm. interchangeable cartridges was so that they could sell more of their more home versions of their arcade games well but the conversions of the uh, arcades uh, is sometimes lacking the original feeling uh, back in those days because the technic uh, technical uh, um, level of the Atari 2600 wasn't good enough for uh, those specialized uh, 
programming programmed software back uh, in the 1970 late 70s and early 80s and um, if you look at other games you sometimes see some comparison that a level was skipped or some features are missing so um, how how was your uh, thinking about it did you normally um, stick to the idea to implement all when you are going to the atari 2600 or did you say okay it's fine that they skip features um, we just need the title on the small system because the name will sell for itself like Atari did on some okay uh, the, when the time progresses in the early 80s Atari uh, bet on on high sales of I said Pac-Man before I know they have licensed it but um, that was like a, a no-brainer it, it was a million seller everybody knew it but the version of the Atari 2600 isn't comparable to the arcade, arcade feeling back in the US in that time. So how was well, your first, approach? First of all, you're correct. Um, the Atari VCS is very limited in what it can do. And an arcade game is not. An arcade mm. game has $3,000 worth of hardware and the Atari costs $200. Yeah. So. And if you were designing an arcade game and you needed more sprites, you would tell the engineers, add more sprites. And they would change the hardware to have more capability. We couldn't do that since the, um, the game system was at home already. Mm. It, was in, it was in grandma's house, as I like to say. And we had to make cartridges that worked with the existing hardware. Plus, mm. in the early days, um, we were very quality conscious. We wouldn't put out a game if it wasn't good to play. It doesn't have to be exactly the same as the arcade game, but it should be a fun game or we would, wouldn't bother. So there were times that we might look at an arcade game and say, there's no way that we can make <clears throat> a fun game on the Atari that is like this game. And so we wouldn't do it. Later, they didn't do that anymore. They, they put out games that they shouldn't have put out, but that was after we had left. Mm. <clears throat> a good example yeah. would be, <clears throat> I did a game cartridge for the Atari mm -hmm. that had Canyon Bomber and Depth Charge in one cartridge. And Canyon Bomber and Depth Charge were two of, our t of Atari's $3,000 arcade games. And I put them both in a single Atari VCS cartridge, which had only 2K bytes of ROM. <laughs> so, and that was, I chose those games because the Atari VCS could make those games. There are games that it can't make well, like Pac-Man, it just can't do Pac-Man well. It doesn't have enough display capability to put out all the dots. Yeah. Um, and, and linking and everything. Linking, was multiple sprites, all those things. Um, you know, I would have never done that. I would have never done a game that I knew I couldn't do well. Um, so do you think that was one of the major mistakes Atari did um, in the early 80s, that they just looked uh, for the short profit? Or do you think it's they that doesn't matter too much because the NES became so big? When I was at, <coughs> excuse me, when I was at Atari, it was controlled by the engineering and programming departments. In other words, Nolan Bushnell understood how to make products. Hmm. Um, when Nolan sold the company to Warner Communications, it became a big corporation. And in big corporations, product decisions are made by management and marketing, not by product development. Hmm. So if you were in marketing and you said, I can buy the, the license for Pac-Man, and you guys will go off and make a Pac-Man game and we'll make millions of dollars. Um, that's a bad way to make that decision because the marketing doesn't know if the Atari can make a Pac-Man game. <laughs> so the real problem is when the decisions are being made by people who don't understand the technology, you get decisions like that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that ha didn't change too much in the industry. I think the technical limits are not the most decisive factor today, but um, sometimes you see that games are promoted in a kind of different way with kind of different promises than those uh, feelings you have or those experiences you have as a gamer when you really play them. So you see uh, that sometimes the at the back side of the DVD, there's something like uh, an advertisement text. And if you read it, you can say, OK, that's true. That that might be true. And that's definitely false. And it's given by the marketing machine, those texts, not by the developers. So having good sales is, is still important. And I think the marketing department has the right to exist or to, the right to promote games. But the problem is that, um, well, they should listen to the designers as well, what is possible and what is close to impossible because of the AI, because of technical restrictions or whatever comes up. Yeah, as a developer, I have one perspective, and that is the best developers should make the best game they can make. And then you hand it off to the marketing department to figure out mm -hmm. how to advertise and sell it. Um, when you have the marketing department turning around and telling the developers, this is the game to make, then from my perspective, that's not a good idea. <laughs> well, you have uh, over 30 years experience, so I won't uh, say something different. But I, without your opinion, I would have agreed to that statement as well. So uh, th these were all questions which, questions which were not on the list because they were just um, uh, coming out of the dialogue or discussion. So I will uh, ask you, we already know some parts, we have researched it, but um, so uh, was the reason to leave Atari because of the name thing or was it because of the salary or was it because you couldn't, they, 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 um, they wanted to have unrealistic things from you, people from the marketing department or from the company uh, leadership. Um, what was the reason to co-found Activision? Well, if you've done your research, you know that all of those things came into play. Um, <laughs> the The work environment at Atari was no longer fun. Nolan Bushnell was no longer around. They brought in a CEO who had never worked in creative field at all. He had come from um, fabric fabric manufacturing. Um, mm, we know what it is. Yeah. Burlington Industries. They make you know, I mean, clothing. <laughs> yeah. um, so they didn't under he didn't understand technology. Um, so it wasn't that much fun. We also came to realize that there were four of us that worked together and we worked well together. And we had been responsible for about sixty million dollars worth of Atari sales in the previous year. Mm -hmm. And we were all making twenty thousand dollars a year salary. And when we went to that president and said, obviously, since the four of us were responsible for so much of your sales, we must be good at what we do. And maybe we'd like to be compensated for that. Mm. And he disagreed with that. He said, no, everybody in the corporation is important to a corporate product. And, and even went on to say that the people on the assembly line who put the games together were important because if they didn't assemble them, we couldn't sell any of them. Hmm. So when they when he compared us to people running the assembly line with From all the blue creative, color creative yeah. and technological work that we did, um, we knew it was time to leave. So <clears throat> did you um, when you talked to him, um, did you have a certain salary in mind or did you think about a participation in revenues or what kind of or more freedom or less time pressure? What kind of things did you hope for? Let's say the he, he would agree to all of your points. What kind of points would he have agreed to? Prior so what, to that point, there was there had been discussion of a bonus, you know, financial bonus plan mm -hmm. that would take, I believe it was going to take 10 cents out of every cartridge sale and a dollar out of every console sale mm -hmm. and put it into a pool and then leave it in the hands of the product development department to decide who should 
be rewarded for work. And when my boss went up and asked, what, where's the bonus plan this year? He looked him in the eye and said, what bonus plan? <laughs> they, had, they had agreed on a plan, but it was never in writing. So he just denied it. Mm. So we were at that time when we talked to the president, we were just looking for something, you know, take a bonus, take a, um, a royalty, anything so that we could be compensated for work well done. Yeah, and just for feeling appreciated. Exactly. Hmm. And um, well, having I think the problem is the people didn't understand in the back in those days that IT business is like today. Um, everywhere, everywhere in the whole world, programmers are wanted by companies and um, you were the very first ones having special skills for a arcade, arcade system or for a console at home. So I think he, they completely underestimated your value and it showed up when you were, uh, when you were co-founding Activision with uh, some of the other uh, persons leaving at Atari. Um, and it was such a big thing, but or it developed really, really great and Atari went the other way. But uh, you always stick to the Atari console. Why didn't you regard, after a few years, the NES or the uh, other gaming machines on the market? Why didn't you um, join them? Because you always stick to the Atari 2600 or to the successes back in the early mid 80s. Even in the end 80s, I've seen that you had some games for the Atari 7800. Well, to your first point, um, <clears throat> Atari didn't value us, that's true. And what they really didn't realize is that it takes a certain set of skills to be able to make a video game on a system like the Atari. Mm. We all know there's right brain skills and there's left brain skills. And if you look today, there are some very creative people designing games They're not actually programming them, they're just designing. And there are some extremely competent programmers and highly technical people involved in the video game business, but typically they aren't doing the designs, they're doing the programming. They're executing the ideas. Exactly. And in that era, the people who made games for the Atari had to have both left brain and right brain skills. We were dealing with some of the highest technology around, but we were also trying to make games that were creative and fun and mm. good looking and with good sounds. And so one person was coming up with the concept, making the, figuring out how to make the concept fun, designing every aspect of the game, drawing every pixel of art, making all the sound effects and programming every single line of program. That's a rare set of skills, and there were only a handful of people on the planet who were able to do that at the time. And the four of us who left Atari had those skills, and Atari didn't realize that it was a combination of right brain, left brain skills that were needed for this job. Hmm. Hmm. So, I understand what you're talking about, yeah. So here we are, you know, extremely good at this type of thing. And the Atari really um, let us show our, our skills. As the game systems got more and more complicated and more and more capable, powerful, um, yeah. you didn't have to do a lot of all of the programming tricks that we had to do. So we stayed on the Atari 2600 a little longer than most because we loved the system. And we had the skills to make that system do amazing things. Mm. And it was uh, still in, in a lot of households in the US. And I had uh, one as a boy as well. I had no none of your games, but I had uh, 
I had a game of from Activision, which was called Kampf im Asteroidengürtel, but I have no idea what the English title is. You had to, you had a small spaceship, and uh, you were on the left and on the right. There were a lot of uh, objects entering, and you had to shoot them like a classic game in those days, as shoot in a card with, game. With, shoot them with laser beams. No, I, I, it was really a, not a rare game because I saw it uh, in a list. Um, where you where, when you see the collectors, um, which there are games which are very common, which are unusual, rare, and very rare, and it was on the rare spots. So I I I do not know the English name, and uh, I know that it was impossible to play when you had uh, 100,000 points at score, because it became so quick that you had no chance to survive longer than 90 seconds or something like this, and you had used up every life you you gained before so i remember that that part of the game design as a horror feature <laughs> and there oh, was yeah. small you are a little young to have have had the atari in your in your childhood well i had it i, I had, had it, it i had it in uh, on christmas 1985 i had the atari 2600 with super ferrari 2000 Come from Asteroidengürtel, no idea what that game is, and Real Sports Football. And later on, I had Real Sports Tennis and Real Sports Boxing. I was a huge fan of Real Sports Tennis and Real Sports Boxing, but I do not know who has designed them. So that's why we called you. <laughs> no, but um, coming to Decathlon, we are, we are doing a long intro, so thank you very much for, for having the time. Um, uh, before we come to De Decathlon, the first game, is your for for Activision is was a smash hit. It was pitfall. And did you have the idea even being in the Atari household, or did you have the idea to do pitfall when you had that brand new company? Now after Atari is demised completely, you can say the truth. So <laughs> actually, pitfall was about my seventh or eighth game at Activision. Really? My, my first game at Activision was Dragster. Then I did Freeway. Then uh, Laser Blast, Grand Prix. I don't know. I, I lose track these days. But, um, you know, Pitfall was in 1982. We started the company in 1979. So it it didn't have anything to do with Atari. It, it couldn't have at that point. We were gone for three years before that. Okay. But, um, the reason I did Pitfall, it's very simple, is I wanted to have a real human character in a game. If you think back to those times, most of the games were spaceships. Abstract or characters. Abstract characters. and Like a smiley or something like this, yeah. Yeah, and I wanted to have a fully animated human character in the game, which is very difficult to do when you only have eight pixels to make your character. So I experimented with drawing these pixels and making the character and finally came up with a pretty nice looking little running man. So I started with the running man before the game. And I actually tried to make a game out of that little running man a couple times and couldn't figure out a good place to put him. So I went off and did Decathlon, or went off and did, actually Decathlon has a little running man in it, so we'll back up. I might have done Freeway, and then I'd do Grand Prix. And finally, I just said, you know, I've, I've tried to put this little running man into a game many, many times. This time I'm going to do it. I'm not going to give up until I can. So mm -hmm. I took out a blank sheet of paper and drew a little stick figure on it that was my little running man. Asked myself, all right, he's running. Where is he running? Um, I drew two lines to make a path. He's now running on a path. Uh, where is the path? Uh, the movie Indiana Jones had been out. The Raiders mm -hmm. of the Lost Ark had been out. So I said, jungle's a nice place to put a path. So I drew some trees. And then why is he running? I had rolling logs. And what is he going after? I put in treasures. So in about 10 minutes, I sketched out Pitfall the game that uses the little running man. Do you think it was important to give him a name like Pitfall Harry? Because most of the characters back in those days didn't rely on a name. Not all of them. Well, his, his name is not in the game in any way. Um, and 
when I was asked what his name is, it just Pitfall Harry sounded good. Um, there wasn't a lot of thought put into his name. Okay. But the uh, the key to Pitfall was when you ran off the right side of one screen, you changed screens and came on to the left side of a completely different screen. So when when most games back then were single screen games, I mean, if you look at asteroids or, you know, even combat, mm -hmm. if the airplane flies off the right side, it stays on the same screen, but wraps around and comes in the left side, yeah. right? Yeah, that but not different cool. screens, that's true, yeah. That meant that I could run off of one screen and come onto a completely different screen. If I had enough time to develop and ROM to fit it in, I could run out of the jungle and run into the city. I could run out of the city and be on the wharf and jump in the water. There are any number of things that I could do. And so that's the power of Pitfall. And it's it's where the, um, the classic um, platform game really came from. There's so much capability and so much of an adventure that you can create if by running off of one screen, you end up on a whole, whole different screen. Hmm. Well, we had a, another world on one of our last episodes and that has, has the same concept 10 years later with another technical background. But I remember back those back in those days that you had not too many um, different settings for each screen and you couldn't leave screens without uh, kind of having issues not going back or uh, having those games were single screen screen games. I agree. That's most of them I have played. They were single screen titles as well. Um, did Pitfall? I, I read that Pitfall sold four million copies, and it was second placed after uh, Pac-Man in that year when it was released in the U.S. So did it change your status or your standing in Activision? By the way, I've. Uh, I've seen the other games. You've de done Cr Grand Prix and everything. I've, 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 I've lost that information and it's now up again on Wikipedia. But um, did it change your standing inside the Activision company having such a smash hit? Um, I wouldn't say so. Um, I mean, I was a founder of the company, so I had a pretty strong position in the company. And mm. the four original game designer founders um, you know, we all did excellent work and those games sold a lot. Pitfall sold, you know, four times as many as the average big seller game. Mm. But, um, I mean, it was funny because like most games, I spent about a thousand hours making that game and Activision made $50 million wholesale on selling the four and a half million copies of Pitfall. And you said so I look back, it in 10 minutes. That's $50,000 an hour for my work. <laughs> well, that's a good salary <laughs> for, for Activision. And um, so uh, when 1982 passed, there was a big crisis coming up. And I know that Sasha is very interested in that area of 1983. So I will hand over those next questions to him. Yeah, absolutely. I, I... Um, we are now in, in 1982 and 1983 is uh, one of the, uh, yeah, uh, there was the video game crash. How did you experience it in Activision? Interesting thing about that video game crash is you could argue that Activision caused the crash. <laughs> okay. Bye. When we, we started this company um, and we were, we were printing money. We were making, you know, millions and millions of dollars. And other companies said, well, I can do that. They didn't realize that it requires a great deal of skill to be able to make successful games on the Atari at the time. Um, but they wanted a piece of it. And we used to go to trade shows twice a year and show mm -hmm. our products. Consumer Electronics Show. And in one six-month period between the two trade shows, we looked in the book and there were 30 new companies making games for the Atari. There were only three and then there were 33. Hmm. So 30 new companies started and they each got some venture capital money and they each started making games and they hired programmers from 
you know, neighborhood, neighborhood kids or whatever, you know, people who had never programmed for the Atari had no experience and didn't have the skills. And so we looked at that and we said, you know, most of these 30 companies are going to be out of business in a year. They don't have good products. They, they, they won't be able to survive. Mm. We didn't take that one step further and say, and when they go out of business, it's going to be a problem. We, we could have predicted that, but didn't. And basically, that's what happened is all those companies went out of business. Nobody bought their games. And so one year, there were 20 million games on the market that nobody wanted. And so it's very hard to get attention for one of our new products when there's 20 million of somebody's old products and people look at it and say, oh, Atari games, those suck. Those aren't any good. Mm -hmm. um, the Activision games were still very good, but the games that were out on the market from those other companies made the whole industry look bad. And you still developed uh, then uh, for the Atari. Uh, I think Decathlon was in during this episode of uh, of year 1983. You de developed Decathlon, and uh, you thought, okay, let's go through it. Can, can I ask a question before? Because uh, I want to know how that, did did something change inside of Activision because of the video game crash? Well, there were a number of changes. Um, just uh, I'll answer the other question first, only because yeah. it came first. Um, I had been working <laughs> on the on the decathlon game because the Olympics were coming out. Summer Olympics were happening in 1984, so I developed the game in early 1983. It was before the crash, um, and you know the Activision decathlon was a pretty good game, high quality, lots of good play, and so it it was not affected by the crash. Um, The company was very much affected by the crash. If, obviously, if you can't sell any games, it's kind of hard to pay your salaries and pay the company, and pay the people. So um, in 1980, I don't know, probably early 84, our president, Jim Levy, had to do something, and we had a major layoff at Activision. Hmm. Now, layoffs happen all the time when, when you know the business changes. What... Jim Levy did that I was very impressed with is what he did is he he had he had written the original business plan for Activision back in 1979. He designed the company based on a business plan that he had created. Mm -hmm. And so in this particular case, what he said is, all right, let's assume that the state of the industry right now, the crash state, is the new normal. And it's going to be that way for a couple of years. If that's the business, we need to design a new business plan. Hmm. And so as if we were starting a new company, he designed a new business plan. And it had fewer people in it than the current company. So then he went through the current company and he filled the new company on paper with the best people of the current company. And those that didn't have a job in the new company were the ones who got laid off. Hmm. So, you know, it's not just go out and lay off, you know, 20 percent of your people. It was a very carefully defined method of creating a new company that would make sense for the new crashed business. I see. Well, that's an interesting look because um, we knew that the... That 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 in game in the gaming industry the number of employees is very vol volatile depending on what kind of projects are coming up and uh, did they have success in the past or did they have a failure in the present and they have to reduce the number of staff so um, that was the same business back in the 80s. A little bit um, nowadays, you know, games are done on contract and it's kind of like a movie. You can be working mm. on a game today, and then when the game is done, you have to get a new contract for your the next movie. More like uh, a freelancer. It's more like freelancers. Mm. Uh, those those companies who have, you know, high quality game development employees, they tend to stay pretty constant. I see. Okay, <coughs> Sasha already started with asking about Decathlon, and that was the f that was our first intention to write you, and um, you. 
um, reacted very quickly on the contract and we didn't have high hopes that you agree to an interview. But um, let's start with the Decathlon questions. It's roughly 20, but we have some after that as well. Um, the thing um, about the inspiration came up in the last answer. You, the, the inspiration to do a, such a sports game was just the Olympics 1984 in LA? Yes. And are you sports interested by yourself or because I've seen you in your history, there's sometimes racing games or there's a fishing game before and two skateboarding games and a tennis game coming up. So you had four to five sports games and on the mobile market where you are today, there's some sometimes there's a sports game appearing. Uh, are you following actively some kind of sports? As I said earlier, um, I was a tournament tennis player for most of my life until my knees gave out. Mm -hmm. My knees are too bad now. I can't play anymore. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, and, and I follow other sports. You know, we have baseball in the United States and local team here in San Francisco. And so um, I do follow some sports. In video games, you know, sports video games are, they're really simulations. I mean, my favorite thing to do is to create an entirely unique concept like a pitfall and make a game out of it. But, you know, a good sports simulation is also important. I will occasionally say nobody has done, you know, as good a job as they should have done at some of the Olympic events. So I'm going to do that and do it as well as I possibly can. I also, so in my career, have always... I've always skipped around in um, in genre, mm. and I've I've been fortunate in if I make a space game, for example, I did Laser Blast, mm -hmm. and Laser Blast was very successful, and people saw Laser Blast, and said, "Ooh, let's make a sports game," and so the year after Laser Blast came out, there were a bunch of sports, or, sorry, space games. A year after Laser Blast, there were a bunch of space games on the market. Well, at that time, I was working on a sports game. And the reason I did it was because I was tired of making a space game. I made one. And I didn't want to make another one. But it worked out really well because when everybody was, when there were too many space games on the market, I was doing a sports game. Or when there were too many sports games on the market, I was doing something else. Largely because I'm developing the year before they come out and you're playing them the year they come out. And so with just about the time that you're tired of a genre, I'm making a game for this uh, new genre. You're ma making it anti-cyclic. Exactly. Yeah, I see. Um, so, um, Back to the Decathlon thing, I think um, two things are interesting because there was Daley Thompson's Decathlon coming up in roughly the same time and he was the Olympic champion in 1980 for Great Britain and they were licensed to a competi competitive program. I didn't play it back in those days so I didn't know it and uh, why, didn't ha why did uh, Decathlon uh, have no someone like Jürgen Hingsen who became second. I know he's a German guy and he is not very popular in the US and I kind of can understand it out of marketing view, but um, it could have an Olympic license because um, the Olympic license was still on the market and it was never used in that 8-bit area. Even on the, on the C64 with Epix, they did something like summer games or winter games, but without having an official license. Was it too expensive or did you say, okay, we do not need it? Or both. Well, remember, the idea is to make a game that's compelling and fun to play, and then hand it off to the marketing department who figures out how to sell it. It's not, give me a license, and then I'll make a game. So I was making the best game that I could make, the most fun game to play all 10 decathlon events. Mm-hmm. Then I, so, handed it to, then I handed it to marketing, and we did hire Bruce Jenner, who was America's decathlete, mm -hmm. and he was our spokesperson, and he was in the marketing and the commercials and such. Um, so, you know, that's, that's marketing. That's figuring out a way to use spokespeople or licensing to add to the game 
But the most important thing is to make a fun game in the first place. So your your uh, focus was in back in this time as well. I've made a game. It's fun to play. And uh, for the background noise, let's having a prom on the on the uh, cover, or let's have an uh, official license. That's your part of the job. That's right. Ah, okay, I see. Because um, that's one point I wanted to ask. Did you develop it completely on your own, or did you have some people play testing it or uh, inspiring you? Or why is it decathlon? Why is it not the uh, the woman edition with the seven disciplines or uh, the something like winter games or summer games where there are not only track and field uh, uh, competitions? Uh, can you say something about that scenario you picked? Why is it the decathlon? Well, when I was deciding what game to to program, I I get out my sketch pad and I draw sketches and I try to figure out again what can the Atari do? And I figured with my running man, I could certainly do racing events. Mm -hmm. If I could also do high jump hurdles, pole vault, if I could do them, then it made sense to do all 10 events. And um, I also, of course, wanted to make it a game where it was physical. <laughs> we will talk about that point. <laughs> That's right. I will come to it. Oh, yeah. We'll come to that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so Decathlon made sense for the same reason every game I ever did makes sense is I made the decision of what can the Atari do and do well mm. and then make it happen. So you still were focused on the Atari development, not going to the conversion of the Commodore or any other kind of systems back in those days. Primarily, your target was still to bring it out for the Atari 2600, even in the mid 80s then. Well, Activision's philosophy was to make games for every console that had sold enough units to be worth our while. And that would be like a million units. When mm. a console sold a million homes, we would start looking at making games for it. Okay. When I did Decathlon, there were 26 million Ataris in the home. More than any other system. More than the Nintendo for years and years and years. Mm. So if I'm going to make a game, first of all, I can make good games for the Atari, and not everybody can, so it's a skill. And there were so many of them in the homes that it was still the best system to make games for. And did you uh, do the other conversions to the Commodore as well, for example, or did you just develop the Atari version? Very early at Activision, um, I made Pitfall for the Atari. Mm -hmm. Then I also made Pitfall for the Intellivision. And I did that because the Intellivision had sold a million units. And we looked around and said, okay, there's enough of them out there. We should do a game for the Intellivision. And I was the primary engineer in the company figuring out how to make games for these systems. I had to figure out the systems, reverse engineer someone else's game system, and then figure out how we can all make games on it. So I made Pitfall on the Intellivision personally as part of reverse engineering and figuring out how to make the console work. Otherwise, my time was not well spent making ports of my games. It was better spent making new original creative games. Okay, so you moved on after having the product released on the Atari. Yeah, if you think about it, if you're making a version of the game on a different console, your job is to make the exact same game on a different console. Mm -hmm. That doesn't require a lot of creativity. It is only a technical task. So we could hand that technical task off to a different programmer, and I would go off and do something creative. Ah, I see. So uh, when, when there's a conversion, it's just an exception that you made it on another system, like right. Pitfall in your example. Okay, I see. Um, there was another 
big sports game and um, I've played it as well, Track and Field, which was released in 1983 as well. Um, did you play it back in those days as an inspiration or did you check it and say, ah, okay, that's kind of roughly the way you can you can do it as well because it's still the joystick shaking thing and there are some other features and I think some are some are discussable if it's better, some are definitely worse and some are uh, like I say, okay, that's, that's something looking back in the perspective that might be useful to have and decathlon as well i will i will tell you the features in a in a in a second so but first um did you play those uh, competitive competitive products back in the days generally no and and not in that case either mm. um those games were being developed at the same time and i don't know the exact timing of which came out first but my game was well established long before I saw anything like it. Okay. Because um, I, I just looked it up on Wikipedia. It's like uh, Track and Field is 1983 as well. So that's why I'm asking. But when you say yeah. you developed it in, in the spring, it's likely to come to be in the development parallel to your product. Right. I've got a question uh, there. Uh, how long was uh, Decathlon in uh, development? Um, you know, a, a game typically took seven, eight, maybe nine months back then. Okay. Okay. Um, so did you, you, you already said you, you were not playing so much, like we are more the consumer <laughs> side and you're more the designer side. Um, but did you have some feedback from colleagues testing it or some, someone who's saying, okay, um, that's a really nice game or did someone say, well, you'd have to improve on this or on that. Was there something like a quality management system behind uh, a developer back in the days? Back in the day, it was a group of game designer programmers and we worked in one room. And while each game was the responsibility of one person, everybody made comments like if i was in between projects mm. we worked really hard to finish a project sometimes all-nighters were working long hours and we're not ready to start a new game right away as soon as we finished a game but we go in every day and we look around and see what's going on and if another one of my colleagues has a game that's nearing completion i'll play the game Okay. So we would play each other's games and we would make comments about things we liked, things we didn't like. It could happen even on a daily basis. You could just turn around and look at someone else's screen and you could tell them how bad something looked, you know. <laughs> that looked terrible. What are you doing? You know. <laughs> so the the advantage of that is we end up with you know, the benefit of all of the experience, all the combined experience in a single game. Okay. But it, it wasn't broken down where there was a testing department and you'd send it off for testing and you get feedback. We tested all of our own games and, you know. So before it goes gold, uh, you were checking it regular with colleagues. That's You're playing, testing it. Okay. Um, I told you there are some parts in track and field. I think um, as a feature, why you you don't you do not have to justify. But um, in, in track and field, one thing I dislike a lot is when you are really a good sh joystick shaker, you could run the 100 meter dash in track and field like in six seconds, 6.5, 6.4. So it's uh, Usain Bolt would be at 60 meters at that time and you are in, in the 100 meter finish and uh, there are some very unrealistic um, um, uh, results given in every discipline. So what I always appreciated even as a kid is that uh, those results in decathlon were kind of realistic. Not some sometimes they were like uh, okay that's close to the world record of a single uh, single person uh, of a specialized 
person who is only doing one discipline and winning gold. Okay, that could happen, but it's very realistic times. So I always appreciated that you had um, that it feel that it felt realistic because of the of the times of the of the long jump of the javelin throw you had to do and those results were like okay i saw that in tv and it's not like 6.5 seconds 100 meter dash um that's a thing i really appreciate and i think the thing uh, having the score over all those 10 disciplines is a great feature as well because i what i liked later on in the epics games was that you had a gold silver and bronze medal and they had the hymns and you had the flags and everything and you could type in your name that's missing in your product but um it was released later a year later and two years later and epics focused a lot on those uh kind of games in those in one or two years later but um i think the the setting of decathlon is fine like it is but when you have a discipline like the javelin or the discus or uh, the shot put uh, you have no angles and that's something i think was well done by or well executed in track and field where you had to hold the button while you throw it and then releasing it and it counts the angle from zero to 90. And uh, why didn't you imp implement it in Decathlon? Because playing it, I, I've played it for the podcast and playing it today, I always thought, ah, oh, okay, I, I, I forgot about it, but uh, all those throwing disciplines kind of feel the same because that feature is missing so didn't you didn't it come up to your mind or did you say it was technical restrictions that you didn't do it or did you say okay it's difficult to 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 to, to implement because of the controller or uh, what was the reason not going for the angles i don't know that there was any particular reason um First of all, the, the biggest problem you run into, as I said, is what can the Atari 2600 do? Mm. There is a limit. And you also have a limit of how much ROM you're going to have available. And every year, ROMs got bigger. Um, my decathlon game was a 4K byte ROM. Now, 4K bytes is 4,096 bytes. This is, you know, an, an icon on the iPhone is 50 times bigger than that. <laughs> so this is the entire game with all the graphics, all the programming. And um, I don't know, I'm not even sure what system the Epix game was on, and I don't know how large the ROM was, but every year you had more more space and more ability to um, to fill it with program. The Epix went for the home computer system as a primary primarily based. So um, it is it has a different approach or a different origin than uh, your own career. So I can explain why the Epics game looks different, but the um, uh, the track and field game from Konami was released for the Atari 2600 as well, and there 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 are the angles as well. So that's why I'm asking. Yeah, again, I don't know how big their ROM was, <laughs> but we had we had limitations. Another interesting thing is we felt very strongly that for an Atari game, you should be able to pick up the joystick and play. You should never have to read the manual. Mm. So you might find that, you know, I do sports games. I've done them and you hold the button down and you fling the mouse and you wait for the angle and you time it. And you, there's a lot of tricky things that people are accustomed to doing these days in their you know, user interface. But back then we wanted the games to be really simple to pick up and play. And so you would know exactly what you needed to do. Mm -hmm. So for something like the um, javelin, I'm going to run as fast as I can, and then I'm going to throw. Okay, that's yeah. what that's what you were trying to do. So um, you could just say that keeping it simple was a premise that we followed back at Activision. I, I never missed it. I never missed uh, this angle feature. I have to admit, because it was uh, no, nah, I wasn't I wasn't good at that. Well, um, both games. I like both both <laughs> games. It was not only the angle thing. I played yeah. both. Um, we are now uh, here on this uh, thing. Your approach to shaking uh, joysticks uh, to death seems to be an interesting one. Um, <laughs> I think it was more fun to watch in friends' faces than on the screen, uh, especially on 400 meter or 1,500 meters. 
Um, why did you decide against rhythm in uh, some disciplines, um, or was it your uh, uh, your challenge to make a challenge for the gamers? You know, I did it because it was fun. <laughs> you know, you, there isn't a lot of thought to that. You you figure out what kind of user interface works well for the game, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if you got a sweat to play this game? <laughs> and You know, once yeah. I made that decision, I did that in all the games. Okay. Oh, okay. And the most important question in the whole interview, how many joysticks did you broke during the de development? I, I broke I about five breaking, or six. I don't remember breaking thing. any joysticks. Okay. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. The, so you the, have played the game, same game like we had. <laughs> the, the trick to that game is short, quick movement. You're not using a lot of muscle. You're not pulling the joystick over hard till it breaks. You just light fingertip controls and you know wiggling it as fast as you can. So I suppose during development, I developed that technique very early so that every hour that I played, I was playing with a very light touch. I must admit I had no manual back in the days. <laughs> so, so that might uh, be the reason why I've broken so many joysticks. It was, I'm sure it was in the description uh, when no, you bought probably, when probably you had an not. original. Probably not. It was something you had to figure out for yourself. Well, I was very enthusiastic. And the, the thing uh, Sasha said, looking at friends' faces, I had no uh, Commodore back in the days. I had an Atari 2600, but my cousins had a Decathlon uh, for Commodore. And it was so much fun playing uh, with two play two people and looking as a third one in the face and on the screen, seeing the man running. Especially the 400 meter dash is kind of really, <laughs> really strenuous because Priceless. in the 1500 meter, uh, you can go slower for the first three, 1300 meters. I really appreciated that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. I, I did that on Thank purpose. You. I said, you know, We're going to have, just like in a long distance run, you get to pace yourself for the first part and then you sprint. Ah, okay. And um, one thing that was interesting, and I saw you posted it on, Twitch as well, uh, on Twitter as well, um, you wrote that uh, not the Microsoft team invented the achievements, it was an Activision thing. And I've read in, a, in an old retro gamer that when you reach a certain score, you could, could, could send a screenshot and a postal card to, postcard to Activision and you get some of the achievement stickers. Do you have the Decathlon achievement sticker and can you tell me on which kind of points did you send it and how many people have sent postcards for games in general and for Decathlon in specific, in particular? Well, I didn't um, keep a collection of the patches. I know some people who have the full set, you have to try really hard because some of them are very rare. Mm. Um, but I don't have any of the patches, I don't think. Plus, I recently um, moved, I was living on a ranch and I moved into town and so I downsized a lot of space. I sent an entire container of that kind of memorabilia to the National Video Game Museum in Texas. Oh, okay. So, so some of your concept scripts or uh, kind of uh, original discs are now in a museum? Everything that I had, I figured they would take better care of it than I would. <laughs> um, but Yes, the um, the patches were something that Activision did, and they were very nice. They were fabric patches that you could sew onto a jacket, and um, I don't remember, you know, it was probably a charge for shipping and handling or something, but um, you, all you had to do was send a photograph of your screen with a qualifying score, and you would get one. Hmm. And I remember we had about 10 people working in the department that answered all the letters, Mm -hmm. And there were there were weeks where we were getting 14,000 letters a week. That's a lot. Okay, so um, with all kind of topics or just with the achievement thing? Well, most of those were for the achievements, although there were a lot of fan letters. There were people writing about how much they loved the games. And so there was someone, someone opened and read every one of them. Okay. Wow. 
Okay. Well, that's uh, that's interesting because we didn't think about questions uh, to that point, but um, I, I completely underestimated the fan posts uh, back in those days. And now we now we make phone calls over the Atlantic with uh, Skype, so <laughs> that's much easier. Um, but I think, um, well, I was too small to write postcards. Um, I've read that your personal score uh, was printed in the um, manual with 10,000 something points. Do you know where the record at the time was f for real people doing the decathlon? Um, I don't remember specific individual scores, but you understand that, you know, I spent nine months making a game mm -hmm. and for the last couple months I'm playtesting because I'm tweaking the game. I'm playing the game over and over and saying it's too hard, it's too easy, there's something I can do here that makes the game more fun. A lot of that, a lot of the work is that kind of uh, work to make the game more fun. <clears throat> So, so did, by the time by the time I finish a game, I am the world record holder. I am the expert, right? I've spent you know countless hours playing the game. Um, so then the first thing we had to do is figure out what is a good score for the patch. Don't make it too high so that people mm -hmm. don't get it. Don't make it too low so that everybody gets it. And we would look at our scores and say, all right. If you're not an expert, you probably get score like whatever we put in the manual. Mm. Um, I think it was over 10,000 points, and that's interesting because um, nowadays the world record holder has 9,500 something points. Uh, so your uh, your achievement was uh, more than 9,000 points, which was uh, back in the days the world record like 8,800 something. So people uh, playing your game uh, worked hard for getting the achievement. And I remember I never had scores with 10,000 points. Yeah. Now I've played it on an emulator with a keyboard. And on the keyboard, it's yeah, it, ridiculous. You can achieve like 12,000 points. You can see it on YouTube as well. Um, so the play game plays completely different instead of playing with a joystick. But I think Atari is very thankful that you released the game for the joystick sales. <laughs> well, and, and a lot of people, you know, there were other companies selling joysticks too. You could buy aftermarket joysticks even back then. And some people found certain joysticks to be better for decathlon than others. Yeah, that's true. I I've, uh, always stick to Atari even when I was playing on the Commodore later on in the 90s. Um, so you said you were tweaking things while playtesting. Do you remember problems which came up with the Decathlon um, in the development time? Well, I will tell a story that uh, has to do with the Decathlon game. There is an organization called Make-A-Wish. And Make-A-Wish um, takes terminally ill children and asks them, what, what is the one thing that you'd like to do? And they make it happen. They spend the money and fly the people out and give them, take them to Disney mm -hmm. World, whatever, whatever. And there was one young man, and his, his wish was to go to Activision and meet the designers and get to be in the in the secret design lab and, and see what's going on. And um, that was his wish. And he came out and I was just finishing Decathlon. In fact, I had just sent it out for production mm -hmm. when he arrived. And it was still secret. So his one of his treats was to get to see the, the next uh, Activision game before anyone else in the world. Mm. And they brought in a film crew, and we set up Decathlon and an Atari and a television set. And he and I played. I showed him how to play, and he was playing, experimenting. And while he was playing with the camera on both of us, he was asked a question by the interviewer. And so he stopped paying attention. He was right in the middle of the pole vault. And, you know, with the pole vault, you run, and then yeah. you press the button once to plant the pole, 
then you press it again to release. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And they asked him a question just after he had planted the pole. And when he looked up to answer the question, he wasn't paying attention and he just started doing this. Uh, Pushing the button multiple times. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching the screen. Well, every time he pushed the button, the pole vaulter went like this. <laughs> okay. Great feature. <laughs> <laughs> a bug in the game. Now, we never put bugs, put the games out with bugs. Mm. I mean, these days you just patch download them. patch, right? Yeah. You couldn't do that. It goes into ROM and then into cartridge and physically into the store. So we and it, it had gold stars. To not exactly, we, we we worked very hard not to have any bugs. So while my face is being filmed for this interview, I just saw a horrible bug in the decathlon game, and tried to keep a straight face. <laughs> and um, the next time they changed tape or batteries or whatever, I said, "Could you excuse me a moment?" And I went down and I told the manufacturing people, stop the presses. Okay, this, this game can't go out. Oh, my God. And I was told, I'm sorry, we've already ordered so many of them, we can't stop it. But I've never confirmed, I've asked people, collectors, if there are two versions out there, if that bug exists, or if it only exists in some of them, or if they did indeed stop the presses and not put out any games with the bug. So, so there, uh, could, there could be a major bug in the pole vault game in some decathlon games out there. So that might be interesting for collectors. That's true. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, did you st tell that story for the very first time? No. No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's a very, very interesting and, and uh, amusing story. Was the TV show... Um, aired uh, within a time uh, that you said, okay, that's a useful advertisement for the product as well, or uh, didn't you pay attention when it came on uh, on television then? I don't remember if I saw it when it came out. Okay. So you, had, you didn't follow it after that? No. Okay, I see. Um, well, if you have more interesting stories like this to other games, we will always listen to them because they are those stories you can't read on the internet. Even if you have told the story to other people, it's not on the cam, I guess. <laughs> um, well, uh, the next question is about the sales. Did the Decathlon meet your expectations? I believe that the Decathlon game sold 500,000 units or more. Um, one of the things that we did internally at Activision is if a game sold 500,000 copies, the company made a gold cartridge plaque, just like a gold record. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we had both gold and platinum. And so... Okay. My wall had all of these plaques, just like if you go into a record producer's office and he's got all of his gold records on the wall. I have gold and platinum cartridges to put on the wall. So that's your personal achievement. Yes. Like we talked about the stickers before. Exactly, exactly. I, I hope I, you, have it, keep, you have kept them. Oh, yes. I believe that Decathlon went gold. Um, Laser Blast and Pitfall went platinum, sold more than a million. Mm -hmm. wow. um, well, we were talking about the technical limitations. I think you pushed it to the limit what was possible for the Atari 2600. But um, coming back to um, some other games, in the late 80s, you changed your systems, back, uh, leaving the the um, platform Atari uh, going Priori pri primarily to the um, Japanese system of Nintendo, um, the SNES then and the Game Boy. And I saw that you did some um, work with licenses like The Simpsons or, or Ghostbusters was on Commodore. Um, so Beautiful you said... Uh, oh, or, or, one of my favorite. It aged very well and um, it's 
always fun to play it definitely i didn't have it in those days so yeah <laughs> um, my my question would be: uh, You said in the beginning, well, I have an idea, and I will um, tr I will um, develop that idea in my head. Then I will program it, and then it's finished, and um, I will start with the next project. But having something like a license for one of the great blockbusters in and with a with a audio hit with Ghostbusters the song in 1984. Um, I think that went a bit different, like the first days you were talking about. Was it uh, the same approach, like saying, "Okay, that's my uh, that's my game. Now it's up to you um, that we get the Ghostbusters license," or did you have the license and then you made the game, or it's the same with The Simpsons later on? Designing the game first is always important. Um, it was more important in the Atari days because the Atari could only do certain things well. Mm. As game systems got more and more capable, um, you had a lot more flexibility. But still, I wanted to design a game that would be fun. And the way I dealt with a license, we'll use Ghostbusters as an example. The um, Some other department at Activision talked to all the movie studios every day and the movie studios would say i've got a successful movie you ought to make a video game about it let's make a deal mm -hmm. and the ghostbusters license came up for for licensing um, at that time we hadn't seen the movie yet usually you get the script before you get to see the movie and because if you don't develop the game before the movie comes out then it'll be too long before it comes into the stores and people will have forgotten about the movie. So it's important that you develop the game at the same time the movie's being developed. We do that from the script. So um, one of the guys came to us and said, we've got an opportunity to get the Ghostbusters license. Um, it's all of the Saturday Night Live guys and you know the script's got a lot of funny jokes in it. It could be, could be popular. What do you think? And It came to us a little too late to really make a game and get it out in time. So we thought about it and I said, well, here's what we can do. I can do a Ghostbusters game um, based on the game I've been working on for the last six months. I was working on a game called Car Wars. Mm -hmm. And you would drive a car and have a top view of the car um, There was an in-game economy where you earned points and you spent your points to buy better weapons, and then you battled with other cars, you know. And I was working on Car Wars, and I had the in-game economy in there. I had the equipping of the car done. I had a road scene. And, you know, I was pretty far along on this game. And I said, all right, well, I could probably create a game using the work that I've done on Car Wars that becomes a Ghostbusters game. So you so, have kind of a feature idea for the upcoming game, taken from one of your projects you were working on. It was a matter of having a technical head start more than anything else. Mm -hmm. But creatively, it's no different. Just because I had the Ghostbusters license, I would still design a fun game. Only in this case, I was designing it in the Ghostbusters universe. So if I needed characters, I would use characters from the Ghostbusters. If I needed scenes, I would use scenes from the, from the movie. Hmm. But what I was in essence doing was designing a game that would have been the same game whether it was Ghostbusters or not, but it just gave me inspiration for you know, how to draw the 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 buildings and what characters to have in it. And instead of adding weapons to your car, you added the ghost vacuum and traps and things that were appropriate to the Ghostbusters universe. And, um, you know, so it was an original game designed to be fun. And it just happened to take place in the same universe as the movie. Okay. I, for, as a, 
consumer, you always think about those uh, licenses for games, um, which are based on a movie in the 80s or even in the 90s. And you see uh, it's a one time cash grab for many companies. So that's interesting for you uh, uh, having a, a designer who uh, has a different approach on those points because I think in some companies your boss comes up and says, okay, we have that, that license. Now three of you, you, you are going to do the game for the next six months or for a full year. And um, it has to be ready when the movie comes out. So there's a, there's a time limit or there's a, there's a shortage of time of, um, of, uh, of doing it. And um, you you, you I, I think the problem is, uh, like I said, from the consumer point, but I think the problem is that you can, cannot use the creative side you have described so well. So I admire that you have done it. it it's still your vision that comes out from from your uh, um, comment. Um, did you um, know colleagues um, who were saying, well, OK, there are some. Uh, did did you have something like a test screening for 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 Ghostbusters before it went public to the cinemas, or did you just have the script? We just had the script, and the game was <clears throat> virtually complete when the movie came out, and Activision rented out a movie theater, and the whole company went to see the movie. Um, but the timing was such that I really didn't even get to get any benefit from things like, um, you know, seeing the game, seeing how they laid out the scenes, that sort of thing. In those days, did the companies who had the movie, uh, I don't know if it's 20th Century Fox or whatever. Columbia um, Pictures. Did Columbia, Columbia Pictures, Pictures, yeah. Okay. So um, did they interfere in the um, creative process or did they say okay that's not possible with our mark uh, with our brand because you are ruining ruining the 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 um, character and its um um uh, its image like it is in the mario movies for example <laughs> so uh is there something like um we had to show our product uh, regularly in kind of uh, before it was finished to Columbia, or how was that process going on? That happens quite often, although it didn't happen in the case of Ghostbusters. Really? Uh, well, Ghostbusters was, you know, a phenomenon. It was a reasonably low-budget movie and just a bunch of comics on the screen making funny lines, and uh, they didn't have a lot of expectation. And it turned out to be huge. So it wasn't like, here we have this big property that we want to be very careful with. Hmm. Plus, they had made the deal with Activision, the number one video game company in the world. And we were the ones who knew how to make video games fun. And they knew that. So they didn't didn't have the need to get in, involved. So but they trusted on you. They trusted us. And, um, and again, it wasn't such a big property at the beginning. It, it became a big property. So I guess the license wasn't too um, expensive for the company. I don't. I know you do not have specific numbers, but I guess that was kind of a, a steal on the market. I have no idea. How did how did how well did Ghostbusters sell? That I don't know either. Um, I didn't pay any attention. Okay. I think it um, had uh, it had some potential uh, upwards because the C64 had a long problem with uh, copies and something like that. Um, okay, um, I think it uh, was more than uh, it was less than expected. I think was the um, copyright infringement of those people who are who were. Um, trading games, uh, one of the reasons why you never decided to go fully on the Amiga or Commodore, or was it just the, um, the, the point that you were always pointing out that um, you were a specialist on Atari, that system was running well, and you had a 
great time with it in the 80s and you had a million sellers on it? Or was it just uh, how, how did the people in Activision react on those uh, yeah, copy marked, uh, copyright problems um, of the 80s? Well, there was certainly a lot of piracy. It was very easy. You yeah, just piracy. copy the disc. Mm. You know, it's so easy to copy the disc. Um, there were copy protection schemes that were come up with and, and such. So it did affect the industry. Um, it didn't affect those of us making the games. Really, we didn't pay a lot of attention to it. Um, you know, in your mind, I stayed on the Atari for a long time. That's what you're thinking of. But then... Mm -hmm. um, what I did was every time a new system came out that was bigger than Atari, we made games for it. So we, we stayed on the biggest machine until someone else got bigger. Um, the Amiga never did really very well in the United States. It was very big in Europe. I know, yeah. Um, and one of the problems with the Amiga is it had tremendous capability. It had the most beautiful pictures that it could make. But it was still, uh, it had a three and a half inch floppy drive, no CD-ROM. And it really was a system that needed something like a CD-ROM. If, if you look at the prettiest picture, the highest resolution picture that the Amiga could make, you could only fit three and a half pictures on an entire uh, floppy disk. Mm. Just three pictures. Well, you can't make much of a game out of just three pictures. Yeah. Right? So you really couldn't take advantage of the graphic capability because it only had that small floppy disk. Mm. So the limit of the, of, the, of the disks and the disk changing, like having 10 disks for a game uh, is a, was the issue not to go for that system. Right. Interesting. Um, I was always a Commodore fan, so I, I had a, an Amiga and a Commodore experience as a kid. Um, and I had the Atari experience. I always missed the Nintendo experience, or let's say most of my friends had no uh, Nintendo, but it was the best selling system in Europe as well. And I saw that you were uh, switching the platforms in the late 80s. So uh, I guess around the late 80s, the uh, decline of the Atari was, uh, that's something I wanted to ask you in the beginning. Did you did uh, when did you feel okay? Atari will have a bad ending. Did you have the did you have that feeling in the early eighties, mid eighties, end eighties, or were you surprised that they had to finish business in with bankruptcy in the nineteen ninety two or nineteen ninety three? Well, I was long gone from Atari. Um, we were designing games for Atari when we were doing it. It had nothing to do with Atari because they had already sold the consoles and the consoles were in people's homes. So it, nothing that Atari did could really affect us. They tried the 7800. It wasn't terribly successful. They tried mm -hmm. to come out with what the, the Lynx and you know, they tried a number of different uh, consoles and none of them worked. And if you don't come out with a successful console, you're not going to be able to survive in the console business. So really what Atari was doing had very little effect on us. We would watch, we were the first third party publisher of video game software. That's what Activision did, mm -hmm. all right? There are a lot of things that we did. We, we made it possible for people to have their names on the games and, and other things. But the biggest contribution to the industry was being the first third party publisher of software. So we had, we didn't make a console. We made only games. That's what being a third-party publisher is. But what that means is we let everyone else fight the console war, and whoever won was the console we would make games for. You were doing the, you were jumping on the bandwagon then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, no, my, my question was not um, related to Activision or to, um, to your strategy. I already understood the strategy, and I think it makes completely sense to act like this. Uh, as a third party developer, uh, no criticism for that. But the point is, um, in your personal feeling, when I talk of something like when I watch a sports game and I think, okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm just a viewer and I'm the audience and I think, okay, that game, they will lose the game. It looks like uh, the bad, the game's completely running against them 
and five minutes after that they have they they get a goal or they they lose the game in kind of a way when did you have the feeling that atari will end up bad well that's what i was explaining is i we didn't pay attention as much to atari because they okay. didn't affect us um I mean, Atari made some bad decisions. Um, you know, the the ET license. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about the ET game as being the worst game ever made, but the real issue was the ET license was the worst deal ever made. Atari offered Spielberg so much of an advance that they had to sell four million copies to break even. Mm -hmm. The first. The profits for the first four million sales all went to Steven Spielberg. And they assumed they were going to sell eight million of these games. And unfortunately, the game, they got more returns than they got sales. <laughs> In the Christmas business, yeah. We, we, I saw the documentary about those people who are um, um, taking them out of the desert. I saw I saw that movie, <laughs> so that was pretty funny. Um, well, I think that's a tra tragedy for them. But you, I, I am um, to make that final. You didn't follow any specific companies like, um, well, that's kind of my past, and I'm linked to it. So you saw it more like a professional, like you now explained it. It's more with a uh, with a distant view, not like a fan. Yeah, it's kind of like with a sports team. <clears throat> When you, when you look at a sports team, they talk about how this team has a 22-5 and five record against that team. Mm -hmm. And they go back for years and years to come up with that record. But they're not the same players. They're not the same coaches. They're not even the same owners. So it's funny to think of it that way. And yet that's how you do with sports. You think of the team versus the team. Well, Atari was not the same Atari that I was at. Mm -hmm. None of the same people were there. Um, they were making decisions that, you know, we all knew were bad decisions. So, you know, we didn't uh, we didn't feel like any ownership. We didn't feel like we belonged. Like, yes, it was nice to work for Atari back then, but this is not the Atari I worked for. But you had no personal link anymore. I understand now what you're what you're saying. Um, well, that's interesting because as a consumer, you you might know that as well. Some fans are. Uh, some people in my age or in Sasha's age are, are fans of Nintendo or whatever, and that brand always stays the same. The logo changes slightly, but you know the characters and you know the games of the days, but you uh, that's why you are um, identifying with those products. Um, but uh, as a developer, I understand what you're talking about, yeah. Um, well, we already finished the Decathlon part. Um, we had some other questions like, um, do you regret uh, doing any of your games or a game where you said, okay, that didn't went the way I had the vision on it or um, I was short of time or there were so many problems. I couldn't do it the way I wanted to do it. And if I had to, the chance to redo it back in the days, I would change something or are you happy with every kind of your visions because you have done like 40 games or, or something like this well <clears throat> on the one hand i i will not release a game unless it's good enough mm -hmm. that said it could always be better you know we have time constraints we have memory constraints we have you know cost constraints so a game I would maybe I would have liked to hire a professional, you know, composer for music, mm -hmm. but there were cost constraints, so I composed my own music. Or, you know, there are always places that things could have been better. But I reached a threshold. I would not release a game unless I said this is a fun game. My my the people who like my games are going to like this game. They're going to enjoy it. They're going to have fun. They're going to play. Hmm. Um, okay, and there were games that never reached that point and went on the shelf. Um, hmm. They're gone forever because you know Activision wasn't very good at saving those kinds of things. They're getting a little better. They've hired a person, an archivist, a person to keep track of their archives, and we have the you know computer museum that that 
saves all the stuff. They used to go dumpster diving at Atari and Activision to take stuff out of the trash. <laughs> so, but those games, I'd, I'd work on them, work on them, and, and they were never good enough, and so I wouldn't release them. So that means I don't have any games that I say, gee, I wish I'd never done that because I wouldn't allow it to be published unless okay. I could be proud to put my name on it. Well, when you read interviews, uh, not every designer uh, stays with your comments, so that's why I'm asking it. Well, in many cases, it's a design team of 50, 100 people. And so you're involved in a project that you have little control over, and it might not turn out the way you, you want it to. Whether I'm doing just one man, one project, as I did in the 80s, or even today, I'm in charge. Mm, okay. I, I don't get involved in a project unless I can decide whether it's good enough to sell. Now, there are also cases where, yeah, like I said, I, if I had more time or more ROM, I would have added more stuff. You mentioned earlier that there are games that, there are arcade games, and they don't have all the levels or something. My good friend Gary Kitchen did Donkey Kong for the Atari 2600. And it has two levels out of the three or two out of, I don't know what it, what the number is. But, but it looks decent. It's very good, and it's very fun. Mm -hmm. And when it was near completion, he wanted to put in the next level. But Coleco, who had the license, would have had to pay for a bigger ROM. And they said, no, it's good enough. So in some cases, again, it, you have limited ROM, limited RAM, limited space, limited time, and those limits will have an effect. Donkey Kong would have had all the levels if Coleco would have put it in a bigger ROM. Mm, okay, I see. Well, um, so you are not regretting any of your games, but um, looking at the sales or looking at your old project, what kind of game do you think is the most underrated game where you said, okay, um, this game was much better than the um, the the criticism of the of the gaming industry of the of the articles in the in the uh, ga game see gaming scene and what kind of game do you think is worth a re revisit today even except pitfall of course well yeah that's that's a tough question um i i normally see it in the other direction um not a lot of my games got bad reviews. <laughs> and, you know, I, I made an effort to make them them come out good. Um, but you know, some of my games, um, I don't know. It's hard hard question to even answer. So, what is your favorite game you have designed? Is it Pitfall? Counting online games. I've actually designed almost a hundred games. Published. Yeah, but I've seen your CV um, on your homepage, so I'm 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 sticking more to Wikipedia. But I know that your active career isn't over with the Wikipedia entries. Yeah, and uh, also when I try to count up how many games I do, I get a different number every time, because over a 35-year career, I worked on an awful lot of games, mm -hmm. and then I'll be doing a list. Oh yeah, I forgot about that one. You know. Um. But despite having published almost 100 games, I go to a you know, convention and I'm Mr. Pitfall. I mean, that's what people remember, I mean, and that's fine. You know, um, Wired Magazine, I think, or one of the magazines recently did a, um, a poll on the top 100 games of all time. Mm -hmm. And in that poll, Pitfall was still 99, number 99. <laughs> And there's been aura. hundreds and hundreds of thousands of games made since then. Hmm. Hundreds of thousands of yeah. games. Pitfall is still at 99. So it's okay if that's how people remember me. Otherwise, every game I did had some neat technique in it that I'm proud of, that just from the inside. Um, Grand Prix. Putting those colorful cars on the screen was extremely complicated. And I do a Grand Prix um, deconstruction talk that's on the internet that you can follow if you're interested and show every little pixel and how, how it was generated. 
Um, I did Transformers for the Commodore 64 and used a technique that was almost like PostScript to generate the images on the screen. Mm -hmm. Something's built in and nobody knows is there, but, um, you know, those kind of techniques. So uh, there's something that would be a favorite in almost every game I've done. Okay. Well, you switched a lot of genres, but um, I, saw, I saw that you've never done a management game, or let's say I couldn't find any of those, or a strategy game or something like this, and real-time strategy games were big in the 90s. So um, are there genres which, are, which have never attracted you? Well, I'll tell you, the most dramatic answer to that question is games like Mortal Kombat. When, when those games started to come out, I had commented to my, my co-workers, I said, that'll never last. That genre is going to be a flash in the pan. Karate games, kicking games, kick fighting, boxing, you know, boxing games, nah, never going to work. Never going to last. There are, what, 10,000 of them now? <laughs> <laughs> so I was wrong, but that was because I wasn't interested in it. Um, same thing with the management games. It's just not something I ever played, so it's not something I would think about designing. Hmm, I see. I, I've played a, a tennis manager in, on the C64, and I loved it. So uh, <laughs> if you want to do a remake, uh, please let me know. I will buy it on Steam or wherever. <laughs> I think these manager, management games are a typical German thing. Yeah, it's more mm. German thing yeah. or European thing, yes. Yeah. Um, well, uh, did you know that Will Wright, I, I read interviews in some newspapers, and The Sims is a very, very famous uh, branch, and I think it's the one of the biggest uh, uh, things which were in the game industry since it existed. Um, I, I'm not sure if Minecraft has sold more now, but uh, Sims is a, a gold donkey for electronic arts and Will Wright ex um, developed it and he had a prototype called Do Dollhouse and I remember I've read an interview with him before the um, the Sims came out with the real title of the Sims and it was done by Maxis Software in the days and he said okay he was inspired by two old games Little Computer People and Alter Ego and if you think about the real big smash hit he has created with The Sims, because that's the title, title most people will rely, rely to. He had done some SimCity and some other Sim things, and he has done Bungling Bay, which is one of my favorite action games on the 8-bit era. Um, but if you think that he just mixed it 10 years later and having that statement now from me, do you regret a bit not doing... <laughs> not doing something in the social life era uh, area more like you like you had with a very uncommon title with little computer people well first of all i think the answer is minecraft has sold more than everybody anywhere of anything so yes they've yes sold more. that's true but so. only for two years now <laughs> um and as far as inspiration goes we're a small community of game developers, game creators, we, we take inspiration from everywhere. Um, Freeway was inspired by a guy trying to run across the road at one of those trade shows I was at. I was riding in the bus to get to the con to convention center and saw a guy trying to run across 10 lanes of traffic to save $10 of parking. And I said, <laughs> there's an idea for a video game. The next video game I made was Freeway. Uh, which was also inspired by um, the original arcade game way back in the early 70s, Space Race. But anyway, uh, so yeah, we take our inspiration from everything we've ever played, everything we've ever done. And I know Will Wright has said that, and, you know, it's it's just the way it happens. It's the way it works in this, this business. Um, your other question was... Yeah, if you if you why haven't you done something like a no. living uh, social uh, yeah. simulation again? Little Computer People was a masterwork. Um, it it had roots in a product that another person had started working on before he brought it to Activision, and we bought it from him, and I took it over. Um, 
there was a lot of effort to make it interactive, to make it understand the English language, mm -hmm. all of those things. But because of all of the amount of time I spent on it, the amount of cost we had to buy the previous version and everything, it was very, very expensive to make, and it lost money. Okay. So little computer people lost Activision money. Before we knew that, we had tremendous plans in the drawing books. Um, I was going to do an apartment, little computer people apartment, where you would leave your apartment and you would go over to your friend's apartment and you two you would interact with another little computer person and an entire community. Basically, I was prepared to do The Sims. But little computer people lost money. And so doing a follow-up to little computer people was not in the cards. Mm, okay, so if it would be a success, that would be... A an in an extension in the universe of com little computer people with new features with new successors coming after that did That's you right. uh, uh, I, I saw that you had a Kickstarter campaign on uh, pitfall in 2012 did you think about any kind of other brand doing a Kickstarter campaign for for example uh, something like a sports game with Deckard loan or with any kind of other uh, brands you had um, not really I mean I'm known for pitfall and the interesting thing about Kickstarter games is not so much that you raise money through Kickstarter to develop games The, the fun thing about that would be if you contribute to the game's development, you can be part of the process. And so the only reason I even did it that way on Kickstarter is I thought that there might be a lot of people who would be interested in watching the process, being part of the process, being you know, involved in the creation of a video game. And it did not fund. <clears throat> And generally, people weren't interested in that part of, of game development. They didn't want to be a fly on the wall um, as mm. much as I thought they would. Okay. So that was the reason I used Kickstarter, and it didn't um, turn out the way I thought it would. It didn't have the interest that I thought it would have. So I haven't thought of any other Kickstarters. Mm, I see. And uh, did you ever have the... If, if the campaign for Pitfall would work, um, would you develop the game on your own and present your uh, your vision as a beta or a new version 0.01, 0.02? Or is it more like developing the game with a community if you are doing the Kickstarter, let's say in the future, or if, if this would have uh, succeeded? Well, that was my hope, was that, first of all, I would have to raise enough money to hire a professional team, because you can't just do it. I can't do it myself anymore. I need an artist. I need a sound effects person. I need a mm. composer. I need of course. You know, other programmers. I need animators. I need all those things. Projects And are bigger, so yeah. It's much bigger. Um, but as far as the conceptual design of the game, I was hoping that we all had kind of fun as a com community design. I see. So it was more like uh, participating in the process, but you will present the results when, right. the, it, was, when it would be confirmed. Okay, I see. Um, will you ever go to Kickstarter again, or do you think the, the um, Kickstarter projects, which are there was a hype in 2011, 12, 13. Do you think it's worth doing a Kickstarter project again, even with a new brand, or uh, do you think that's wasted time or wasted energy? Well, the, um, the difficult aspect of making a game in this day and age is the cost. Hmm. Um, A game can cost, you know, a hundred million dollars to make now, certainly a, a blockbuster game. And for a company to invest a hundred million dollars in a game, they need to know in advance what the game is going to be. There's no room for experimentation. That's why you see so many sequels and so many copies. 
if you go into an investor and say, I need $100 million of your money, and I'm going to make a game. And you brand game. He won't Whatever. give it to you. If you say, I'm going to make a game, they're going to say, what game? And you have to say, well, it's Call of Duty, but it's in the desert. You, you have to put it in the terms of another game that they can understand for them to have comfort in investing. Mm. So there's still a benefit to Kickstarter and places, you know, crowdfunding systems like that. But what's interesting is a crowdfunded video game is not so much raising money to develop in the same form that you would by going to Activision and asking them to fund your development or whatever. What you're really doing is you're pre-selling the game. Mm. Simple as that. You're saying you pay me $20 now and you get a $40 game when it's done. Mm. And because you did it now, you get the discounted price and your money helps pay for development. So it's got, people don't realize that it's really not raising money, it's pre-selling a game before it's been made. Yeah. So if I had a game concept that made sense that way, I would go back to Kickstarter. I just don't have any plans right now. Okay. What kind of projects are you currently working on? My day job right now, I work, I consult with, um, with attorneys on patent issues. Um, you know, I was in the room when a lot of these technologies were created, if I didn't create them myself. So I'm able to um, provide expert uh, cons cons consulting work mm -hmm. for explaining how technologies work. So you're back to the engineer side? Pretty much. Less. Doing the consulting for uh, copyright issues or uh, development, uh, that, that everything is working fine. Some copyright, some development, but mostly patents. I see. Um, well, let's say you had a f two final shots in the gaming industry. One is like you may develop with the team of your dreams, so you can buy every co-programmer you want you can define the genre and you can define um, what kind of game it is N not looking at the uh, budget and not looking like this game has to make money what kind of game would come up for you and who are who would you like to work with wow um i have to say that You know, there have been video game projects, there have been movies, there have been projects over the years that were a person's dream project. Mm -hmm. um, the, the movie Toys, for example, was the dream project of the producer of Toys. The one with Robin Williams in it, I don't know if you know the movie. I know the three Toys movies, yeah. Yeah, the Toys, all right. And... Every time someone has set out to make their dream movie, it's been a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you don't design, you don't go that way. Uh, it's a risk to go that way. I wouldn't say I'm going to make this game because I've always wanted to have this type of game. I would, I would do it because it's going to do well, it's going to be good, it's going to sell a lot of units, it's going to make people happy, it's going to entertain people. You know, I have a lot of other considerations. That would be the second question. So uh, I, I will ask you for one product which you are limited to, but you say, okay, that will, that, that will be a smash hit with a high chance. And there's the second perspective, because I know that you're not a... The gamer, like uh, I spend like uh, three hours every day playing, but let's say you have played in the past and I think you're still playing a bit. So um, what kind of game do you think this would be? Let's say I do not have to look to any restrictions budget wise. This would be the game I would do like uh, the, the uh, Chris Roberts is doing with his Star Citizen for example. So uh, do you have anything in mind which comes up to you where you say, this is my star citizen, if I have no restrictions on money or anything? And I know he has Chris Roberts because it's such a huge project and it will never be finished. 
but uh, we are talking in theory now. So as a as a as a gamer, not as a designer now. Wow, I take each project one at a time. Um, yeah, you're, would... you're answering as a designer. Yeah, I, know. I think you, you'll have to answer like someone who's who says, "Okay, I need virtual reality, or I need a, a game which." I think that genre never shows up because it's not successful and I want to play a game which has which contains. I don't have any of those. I I you know, I I'm not a big believer in virtual reality as a an a revolution. Mm -hmm. It's just the next level of evolution in the technology. Um but I would use the latest technology. Um I'd want to have a quality team of professionals. Um, and before I got done with the design, I would know that I had a game that I would find fun. Okay. Now, I don't know what that is until I start. Until I start designing a game, I don't know what that game's going to be. So I admire you. You have no unfulfilled wishes when you answer like that. That's true. You're, you've always done what you what you think that's my that's the next game I want to do. That's true. I guess many of the, in the gaming industry nowadays admire you on that position because many of them haven't got that experience that you have working on a game for several months alone or in a team with two or three other people. Today, those teams are, because you talked about the 100 million budgets, they are so big that you have to stick to your role. So um, is that uh, one of the reasons why you left the... I know you are. Um, you have done a lot of mobile, th mobile, com mobile uh, games, and I know that you have talked about being an engineer and talking about patents and uh, consulting uh, lawyers. Um, but is that one of the reasons why you left the gaming industry because the control over the projects was getting slimmer and slimmer? There's a little bit of that. Um... Again, the, the ability to create something unique hmm. is it's it's there for small projects. It's not there for big projects. Because again, the people who put up the money aren't going to put up the money unless they can understand what the game is before they invest. Well, that means you can't do anything original. Everything yeah. has to be derivative. Everything has to be something that they understand. So there is that problem. Um, The, the main reason that I'm not making games on a daily basis is because it's very difficult to make enough money on a game to pay professionals to develop it. I mean, you for, have to make for meeting money. your standards. You have to make money because mm. you got to pay the people, right? And unfortunately, Apple has convinced us that 99 cents is a good price for a video game. Not forty dollars or sixty dollars or eighty dollars. If you, you know, I do not play mobile games, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and there are millions of them out there, <clears throat> so it's also hard to get the attention mm. of the player. I had I I put out a mobile game on the on the iPhone, and I remember one of the reviews that I got was a bad review. You always read the bad reviews. You don't read the good reviews, right? <laughs> and <clears throat> Basically, <clears throat> you know, it was a young player who said it wasn't worth the 99 cents that he paid. And I had spent eight months of my life with a half a dozen professionals making this game. Mm. I wanted to grab the kid by the shoulders and shake him and say, you got less enjoyment out of that than an order of french fries from McDonald's? <laughs> But I think that it's just the range. <clears throat> It's like um, you're you're the the, the game do, does not meet your expectations, and you say, okay, um, the next game I buy for 99 cents meets my expectations, no matter if it's the better quality or less quality. It's just an individual experience, and that's why I think you shouldn't stuck to too many negative reviews because no, it's, um, it's more that there are so many free games out there that they're saying that I got as much benefit out of the free game as I did out of the 99 cent game. And the free-to-play games are also a bad thing, in my opinion. Um, in my opinion as well, but if, if for you, other if, reasons. If you go into a design meeting in a company today, 
they can't make any money selling the game, so they have to give it out as free to play. And so 90% of the time in meetings is figuring out how to get an extra dollar out of your, your customer. How do I pick the pocket of the kid playing? Adjust not, the how tables. do I make the best game? Mm -hmm. you know, and so that's, that's probably why I'm not in the business right now. Okay, so adjusting the paywall system, making the people pay after an hour, after two hours, after four hours. I know what you're talking about, and that's why I do not like the games. I stick to those more conventional games of the past, uh, let's say to the consoles or to the to, the, uh, to Steam or Origin or Uplay, whatever kind of platform uh, there is. But, um, well, I think the quality of the most of the mobile games does not meet the expectations of a conventional gamer. It's more casual gaming and it's more like the, 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 the target group is different. It's more um, unisex than the male group. Most of the titles of the past are, have the male group as a, as a ta main target group. Um, so I, I cannot identify with any of those mobile games. I have some on my uh, on my uh, mobile phone. I'm not a mobile phone user too much, but I think most of them are a waste of time. That doesn't mean they have no quality because I know that the uh, that the gaming experience is different, uh, the um, the pricing is different, and uh, the the places where you play the games are, are different. But I think they never can. They, they, they rarely or they never can be compared with those games you play in front of a computer and, or in front of a console. And that's the expectations they'd have to meet for myself. That was just a comment. So uh, not linked to any questions, but uh, that's why I think the mobile market is a, is a market where there's a lot of money out there for developers if you are lucky. But uh, like you said, most of the time you need the attention and you need a lot of luck that you're product is the next big thing on Play Store or on iTunes or wherever. So I think I that's very difficult. Yeah. Never thought about going to Steam as an independent developer or, or, or on any other platform, like Greenlight was the old system there. Um, I never completely write off any, any opportunity. I'm mm. still thinking about game ideas all the time. And um, Steam would be a possible way to, to publish. Okay. I told you, you have to say one thing as a gamer. And now there's coming the development. <clears throat> what do you think is a close to secure cap crash for a, for, a, um, for a developer? Not for yourself, for a publisher. Is it like a big established brand like Battlefield, Call of Duty, sims or whatever or is it more like um we are going on the mobile market doing those paywall things uh, like uh, clash of clans or any kind of other very famous things where do you think is the if, if if i say you have a project i'm your boss you are doing the project and i say earn me as much money as you can what kind on what kind of horse would you bet Today, 2018. Mm -hmm. Well, I would probably, <clears throat> I would probably develop a game on mobile. Mm -hmm. um, I would do it in such a way that I would analyze Apple's strategy for featuring a game and figure out what kind of game you could make that would guarantee you being featured by Apple. And there's so you would, do, you would search a cooperation with Apple, talking yeah. in the process of doing it. Okay. Yeah. And um, what do you think about those meta text things for, uh, for uh, finding or identifying it in a store? Do you think there are some which are more likely to get in the top result list without a corporation or do you need to talk to the Play Store holder or iTunes? I think if you can get featured in an app store, whether it's the you know Apple Store or you know Google Play, that's your bet your best bet. Getting okay. featured you've got to be on the first page. I see. <clears throat> okay. 
Well, that's very difficult to achieve. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever achieve it with any of your mobile uh, products? Oh, yeah. Um, I had a number of games that were number one in the App Store. Okay, what kind of, uh, because I do not know anything about the mobile uh, story, I know that you are in the market and we have seen it in your CV on your homepage, but um, what kind of products did you sell best on the mobile platforms? Um, you know, casual sporting games, um, ski ball like games, um, basketball, pop a shot. You know, the arcade where you're shooting baskets as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. Simulations of things like that did really well in the early days on the App Store. Okay. So you were more linked to the casual side, which is so successful on the on the mobile phone. Um, do you think um, if you return to the, to the computer or to the console, will you stick to the casual side or will you go to the more conventional or traditional gaming side which is has more depth or uh, more features as a designer now uh, coming out of your heart absolutely depends on the concept um, I see. you know every any game has to have depth um, but a game that you want people to pay you know sixty dollars for had better be a very deep experience and, mm. and include all that work Now, understand that in the 80s, um, the hardcore games and the casual games were the same games. You played, you know, the hardest core game player was playing on their Atari in the living room with their, their family. Right? So it was only later that the hardcore game player became a small subset of game players. You know, some of the hardcore games were, were selling to only 10% of the audience. Mm, okay. Then all of a sudden we had what they called the casual game boom, where 40-year-old women were playing. And now you started to bring those people back. But I like to point out that um, everybody thinks, you know, games that are, appeal to average people are new. But no, that's what all of my games were like in the 1980s. Okay. They appealed to everyone. Well, today there's a more the, like a target group system like in the 80s that you haven't done research before a product was on the market. And I think most of the big companies are looking what is uh, popular at the moment, like the Battle Royale system or like uh, you had the, the thing with the free to play sector or whatever comes up. So uh, companies are informing much more before they start a project, but you as a single person or as a person who's working in uh, in smaller groups i think uh, it's nice to hear that you're still li listening to your guts so i feel that if i make a game i'm going to make a game that's fun for me to play hmm. and there are enough people out there like me that they'll have fun too hmm. okay um, do you have any idols or people you had a you wish to have a cooperation um For designing a game, let's say um, if I have to uh, be in a, on a sports team on soccer, I would play with Rudi Völler or someone like this because I always liked him as a striker. Yeah, I know he's old now and he's 50 years plus. So I would I probably choose uh, someone who to be uh, more in shape today. But um, do you have any kind of uh, icons, idols you were? Uh, admiring for their technical work or for some kind of games you were liking or um, is there someone in your biography or in your mind that comes up from I the gaming can't industry? I can't think of anybody that I would single out. Um, you know, these days game development is a team of professionals and every every individual I like to work with people who are very good at their specialty, you know, excellent artists and excellent composers. And, you know, there are some technologists out there that have done amazing things, um, you know, physics engines and other things that are out there that I'm very impressed with. Mm -hmm. Most of them are nameless. They, mm -hmm. We don't know who created some of these things, but uh, I like working with very, you know, competent professionals. So specialists. Yes in the area okay and uh well our question list is 
close to be finished. I know. I do not know if uh, Sasha, if you have any questions, you may interrupt me anytime. Oh, you're, you're uh, making it good. Um, so, do you ha still have contacts with old colleagues from the Activision era, or from any kind of other companies, or is it just like now we have a product, a project, or we are we are at a, a convention and we see each other? So. That's why we are having contact. But uh, do you meet some of those people from former days in private? Mostly it is at trade shows, conventions, uh, classic gaming conferences. Uh, we get to see each other again and and we all you know go out to dinner and we, we talk about the old days and that sort of thing. But there are still a few people here in the Bay Area that I do contact. Mm, okay, so you have some kind of contacts to other designers too. And yes. do you still exchange about um, projects or is it more like he's working on something and I shouldn't ask or he's he's glad that I do not ask or uh, how do the people, I know everybody's different, but how is the, how is there something like an ethos, uh, not asking, asking, trying, giving an advice or staying away from it. So uh, how do you normally handle it with your relationships? Back in the day, it was very secretive. Um, there was a time at Activision that you had to pass practically a security guard to get into the design lab, even if you worked in the company. Except so, you had a television team with you. Yeah, it, that's true. <laughs> it was very, you know, very secretive. Um, today, it's a lot more open. Um, you know, people publish their their code on the internet. If you're working on something in Unity and you're having a problem figuring out how to do it, um, you do a Google search and there's 10 people who just did the thing once before and they published it. So there's a lot more collaboration. It's a lot more open. But specific things like, you know, typically you know, I'll meet one of my friends and they're working on a stealth company. And so they can't talk about what they're doing, what the project okay. is or the company. And so it, it's more open in some cases, but in other cases, it's just as just as security conscious. I see. Okay, so it depends a bit on the people, on the project, and on the situation. I see. Um, well, do you have any um, kind of things you miss from the '80s or from the the time you, oh yeah, you were founding Activision or from the first years that you said that's that was lost in the industry today? Well, I certainly, um, I always liked having a small team where you respected everyone and you respected everyone's opinion. Even though the responsibility for the game was mine, it was nice to have people sitting around me whose, whose opinion I trusted and could talk over things like that. A small circle. And we ended up at Activision, we called it a, de a design center. This was a philosophy that we came up with that because we started with four designers who worked well together, we were worried that if we had 30 designers and everybody's in one room, it would be, we couldn't get any, any work done. Hmm. So we, we would separate groups into small groups of five or six people and call them design centers. And in the 80s, Activision had a design center in New Jersey, in Boston, in Sacramento, um, LA. I think there was another one somewhere. So we would have these small mm -hmm. design centers. And I liked that concept. Sadly, for some reason, what has happened is the, the Facebook um, philosophy. If you look at any of these companies, software companies nowadays, there's 150 people in one room. They're all sitting at low desks. There isn't even a cubicle separating the people. And I don't know how anybody gets any work done in that scenario. Um, and be, but because a company like Facebook or Zynga does it, people are now building their design labs that way. And it's ridiculous mm -hmm. to have all of these people sitting there, all of them listening to different music, all of them plugged into headphones, nobody looking at anybody else's screen, even though they're all right there because it's too much of a distraction. So what I think has been lost is the 
the small cooperative design group. Community and team spirit, you mean? In kind of way that, that's part of the identification with your project and with your colleagues and the things you're working on. Exactly. Okay, so you think um, that's uh, the biggest issue that's uh, that's getting lost. Uh, what do you think is one of the things you wish to have in the 80s, is it the technology? Is it the higher budgets? Is it the bigger market? Is it uh, the 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 new platforms or the mobile thing? Is there something? If you say, "Well, I'm 25 years old again, and um, my career is in front of me, and those things are there," what kind of things do you admire, 25 year old or 30 year old engineer, programmer today? What you didn't have in the 80s? So what is the most important thing for you, which you would have to, which you wish you had in the past? Sorry, that's not grammat grammatically correct, but. <laughs> I, I understand what you're asking. The, um, the development environments are much better today. Mm -hmm. When I was making Pitfall, I had a piece of graph paper that I colored in with pencils to make pixel art. I literally had to color them in and hold the sheet up and say, that looks like a person, and then make the pixels on the Atari and see what it really looked like. Uh, Photoshop didn't exist. Mm. Unity no. didn't exist. Unity didn't exist. So the development environments are extremely good today. Now, that said, I was better off not having that. Because when you have those kinds of development environments, the barrier to entry is much lower. Mm -hmm. A million people could start a game tomorrow by just downloading Unity. I What agree. We, did, we had to have the engineering expertise to create hardware that connected to the Atari. We had to have software expertise to write software that ran that system so that we could edit and modify video games as we're developing them. We had to do all of those tools for ourselves, but it separated us from the rest of the world who couldn't make their own tools. Mm -hmm. So in fact, the tools are great, but I, I did better because I didn't have tools from somewhere else and I happened to be good enough to be able to make my own. Okay, so you think the elite status is a bit lost in your industry then with those developments because it's free for everyone to enter and that's a good thing and a bad thing as well. Because right. you you were talking about the mobile games and I'm not a talented programmer, but uh, let's say I'm doing a game, it could be um, that I get more response than someone who has done the better program, but it's not... Um, The, the the people cannot find it or it's not identified by the by the consumers because of the platform thing and it's so um, so many different apps for for games or for the same thing of of usage. So do you think that's that's the main problem today? As you say, it's a blessing and a curse. Ah, oh, okay, I see. Um, well. If you look at the industry in the last 30 years, every decade, there were so many changes. So what do you think? You said you do not believe in virtual reality. What kind of things do you think uh, the video game industry will have to? I, I do not mean the the, the technique in, in specific, like let, let's say I, I, I'm not talking about um, people who are uh, having triple speed of a computer or anything. I mean, not the technical side. I mean, what kind of things will be possible because of the technical side? What do you expect for the next five to 10 years? Well, to clarify, it's not that I don't believe in virtual, virtual reality. What I said was it's just an evolutionary step. It's not, it's, really a, it's not a revolution. It's just the next evolutionary step. So um, most of the history of video games has been tied to technological improvement. Mm. Every couple of years, a new console came out, and each new console has more capability. 
we are now at the point where that change doesn't matter much. Mm. The difference between a PlayStation 3 and a PlayStation 4 isn't too big. Is, is not very big compared to, you know, as far as a publisher. One, two, two, publisher. three, yeah. I understand, yeah. So now you're at the point where it is the creative expression that makes all the difference. Creating a new concept, implementing that new concept in a really good way, you don't have to worry so much about what can the hardware do because the hardware can do everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's hard to answer your question about what what new things are going to happen because I don't have a crystal ball. Yeah, of but, course, that, that that's not like you don't do not have to be the prophet because when you say something, it could be completely wrong. But um, what do you wish that comes up or what do you think that comes up? So you do not have to be right. Maybe you look at our interview in 2025 and you say, okay, that was completely bullshit. And the interviewer said something which was com which was much worse. <laughs> yeah, I think that since the technology is no longer limiting, and the creativity is is what is much more important. Um, what I would like to see is more content that that um, generates an emotional response to the player. So more storytelling, or more um, more going into um, uh, c catching the the person who's playing the game. Something along, yeah, drawing them in and um, and making making it a more immersive experience is a good thing. And virtual yeah. reality will certainly help with that. But um, you know, it's often been said that video games don't convey emotion, and they're certainly catching up. They are now going to be able to convey emotion at least as well as a movie does. Hmm. Um, so I think that's the direction that more creativity can be applied to. Okay. Um, we're coming to the end. I have two or three questions left. One thing is, uh, do you think uh, the video game crash can happen nowadays, like it was in 1983, with some impact like it had back in the days? I know there will be much more survivors and it won't go to the bottom, but do you, do you see any kind of hazards like... Uh, too many games put out every year and the, the, the consumers are, let's say, I, I'm a good example. I'm having a Steam account and I have played like 15%, 15% of the games I have on my account and the rest of the games is like zero minutes used. And when, I, when, the, when the complete industry stops developing games, um, I have years to come where I can use my not used library. So do you think that might be a, a hazard for the industry on the mid run or on the long run? Or do you think uh, it's just like people are grabbing it and they are for, out for the next sale because I'm always buying something in the sale, even knowing that my library is so big. So, um, well, you could argue that the video game business has crashed. Um, you look at the mobile industry and the inability to sell games for a purchase price anymore. Um, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of people trying to get into the video game business and losing their shirts and not being able to do that and now working at Home Depot. Um, you know, it's, it is not, you know, particularly healthy, but there are so yeah. many different segments of it. You know, yeah. there are blockbuster games on console and there's Steam and there's mobile and there's online and, and, um, you know, there's any number of different ways of entertaining people. Mm. I mean, I, for one, don't go off and chase down Pokemons. I mean, and yet millions of people do. And so uh, an all-pervasive crash is never going to happen. But in fact, it's not very healthy business to be working in. So it's, it's already yes. something to crash. It's changing a lot uh, if you look at the industry, and no matter if it's the the the, the console uh, life circle or if it's the uh, platforms now, the digital platforms you have, there's always a change even in five years or 10 years or 15 years, what kind of games and genres are popular and what kind of brands develop and which one decline. But I am, when I say my 
two biggest points. I would say I'm not a prophet either, so I could be wrong. But I think the next thing that comes up in the industry within the next 10 years is streaming of games. And I think one thing that is even bigger than streaming of games is something like a Netflix or an Amazon Prime for games where you just have to um, subscribe to a service like you you are doing now for for in the in the video video section um, which wasn't uh, there in the 90s and in our country it's mo much more fresh than it is in the US so you have it for a couple of years now and Netflix has started I guess 2014 2015 over here um, I think some kind of those services are already prepared to launch so if you look at the origin access premiere on the xbox live gold system where you where you have a membership i think those things are the first preparations for catching customers or collecting customers and going away from the consoles going to big service stations where you where your game is calculated and most of the processes are calculated within a server room and your uh, your uh, console or your computer will become uh, something like a co-processor. That's, I'm not a technician, but I, that's the kind of way I think that we will, we will be one f future thing that might come up within the next 10 years. So talking to 20, 30, 12 years. Well, let's revisit this podcast in 25 years and see how good your prediction is. 12 years. And the, the second thing, because you said um, the, the evolution of VR, I'm a bit more skeptic than you because I've played VR and I think it's a very immersive concept. That's what, that was the word I was looking for before when I described it. Um, but there's a one big issue which I had with a... V, which I had with the uh, uh, Xbox camera and everything, you need the space. And I cannot play it together with someone else because when I have the the, the glasses on, there's a screen, my eyes are completely blocked. So I think the approach that Microsoft does, uh, like an embedded reality with the HoloLens, might be the better solution to have it on the mainstream market. I think the virtual market will exist and it will flourish for a certain time, but I think the limits are uh, not like on a skyscraper limit. It's a limit which will be reached by nerds or by normal people. I do not think that the virtual reality thing will come up in the main market during the next 10 years because of the socialism, uh, the socializing aspect that's completely missing in VR. Well, I agree with you that nobody is going to want to stumble around their living room yeah. with goggles on. Um, the, uh, the augmented reality or AR mm. is in, in my opinion, definitely, you know, much better than VR, but I consider it a subset. So when I say VR, I mean VR and AR. You're too, you're talking about both things. Yeah. Okay. I see. Well, I'm not a prophet, but we will look at it in, in 25 years when I'm an old man and you can say he was bloody right, that guy. If, if I'm around <laughs> in 25 years, I'll be happy to have this conversation. <laughs> or we will repeat it when you are up in 25 years. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for having so much time for us. I've looked at the clock and it's two hours, 45 minutes. So. I'm at the end with my questions and I had a list with 46 questions and we marked it like green, he has to tell you and red, he might tell you and black are my questions. And Sasha didn't say anything for a full hour. I um, have finished every question. So now it's your chance to ask <laughs> Mr. Crane for the last time. You ask every question here and uh, it was so interesting to listen to you both. Um, no, I don't have any question anymore right now. But uh, I have to thank you um, to this nearly three hours conversation here. And I'm really honored to listen to you, to you both. Oh. Well, I'm feeling sorry for your poor subscribers who have had to sit through this entire uh, video, but um, I'm happy <laughs> to have been here. The, the good thing is we do not have any much sus subscribers, so no one cares. It was just more for, for us as a fanboy section or for 
uh, having a, a review and we are doing uh, something like an episode beside that interview. So we're going to post the interview and we're going to talk in a German episode about decathlon um, uh, together. And we're going to share some of the experiences or we might, we might uh, cut something out from the interview where you're talking about certain points. But um, there will be the interview as an episode, which I think I will rewatch it. <laughs> uh, um, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you're right. Three hours is a very long time for any kind of normal YouTube user. Yeah. Are we allowed well, to, to post it on YouTube? Sure. Yeah, perfect. Feel free. I, I'll have to say thank you very much for taking the time. I know it's not uh, something like which is okay, we are going to ask and he will say yes, because we've asked for another episode as a person and we had no reaction. And to be honest, I didn't re I didn't have uh, the 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 um, expectation to have such a friendly and warm and uh, uncomplicated contact. And you always reacted very quickly. And thank you for having three hours of your time. I know that you're a busy man as well even without being in Activision anymore. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to have been here. I have to say your English is excellent. Oh. Um, I speak only one language, except for the 25 computer programming languages that I speak. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're talking 24 more languages than I do, so. But, um, it's, been, it's been fun. Okay. okay. Do you have any last questions to ask why we did it or anything that comes up because I asked you in the start, in the beginning and now we have we are at the end so if anything comes up to you feel free to ask us I think we've pretty well covered these topics Okay thank you very much if we have any of those games because Sa Sasha said he's so much into Ghostbusters we <laughs> might give you a call in a, a few years is that okay Sure we are going to not. We are going to skip most of the parts because you gave us a very good impression about Absolutely. the last decade. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much, and have a Great. nice day, and enjoy California. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye. Goodbye.